All right, he's from The Athletic. It's one of the, the biggest sports stories in the world right now. A deadline day spending. And Chelsea, who have just broken the bank all over the shop, are to secure pretty much a whole new team. Liam, welcome to the programme. Hello, yeah, pleasure to be here. It's 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 never boring covering Chelsea, and, and right now it's uh, particularly particularly mad is this unprecedented the amount of players just the, just the volume of players that they brought in uh i think certainly the numbers in terms of spending are unprecedented they've broken records all over the place uh even even if you adjust for inflation i think this is right up with what roman abramovich did um when he first came into chelsea in 2003 and I'd say the player turnover over these first two windows has been roughly equivalent. I'd need to go away and look it up, but I think there were five or six players last summer and, and seven or eight in this one um, across, you know, academy prospects and, and, and big high profile first team signings and, and plenty of headline grabbing deals as well. Chiefly, of course, uh, the one that brought Enzo Fernandez to the Premier League on deadline day. Look, I mean, when you look at the accounting and you look at the rules, and I mean, we all know how this works. I mean, there's loopholes, there's ways and means around it, and uh, I mean, it's just it's 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 whatever you think. There is another layer to it that you that you don't realise and don't know about. In terms, you know, of what most people look at, they go fair play uh, and and financial fair play. How can this possibly happen? But I guess what they're doing is within the rules. Otherwise, they wouldn't be allowed to do it. Well, I mean, it, it, it's worth it's worth noting that financial fair play is enforced retrospectively. So <laughs> we won't know for a while if uh, if Chelsea were allowed to do everything they've done um, until UEFA get a proper look at their books and, and decide what they're going to do. But what we, we do know that, you know, from the moment they came in, um, Todd Bowley has, has repeatedly said that financial fair play is a consideration. Um, and that they they do they are mindful of remaining compliant. So I think what we're seeing is a case of um, these new owners being as creative slash risky, <laughs> depending on a, on your point of view, as they can possibly be um, to to push the boundaries of what Chelsea can do while remaining just the right side of the limits of, of financial fair play. And that, that, you know, there are some conditions that have allowed them a little bit more wiggle room to do this. We, every, we, everyone's talked about the contracts and amortization and everything um, at this point, but also the profit on player sales that, that, that Chelsea made in the, in the final years of Abramovich, they were one of the things they were always good at was, was selling players for, for good money. Um, and that has left Bowley and, and Clear Lake Capital a bit more room to be ultra aggressive in these first two windows. Liam, I suppose for most of us football fans uh, that, you know, we, we are cynical and rightly so because Manchester City were punished. It was a two year ban that was uh, slashed in half. It was then suspended and, and it, there, there was no punishment because to me, the punishments have to be docking of points or you don't play these competitions. That's the only effective way that, that that you will actually get everyone to comply. Would you agree? I mean, if you find billionaires, I mean, it's just a laugh, isn't it, as far as they're concerned. If you take points off, that actually does count. Yeah, I mean, from my personal perspective, I, th I think financial fair play lost credibility when, when you had, you know, PSG basically getting off on, on legal, legal technicalities uh, in terms of, you know, the way UEFA had, had handled the, the sort of procedurals of UEFA bringing charges against them. And then everything that happened with Manchester City, I think it's it's very difficult to argue that, that financial fair play has real teeth when, I think the latest round of punishments that were announced in September last year amounted to a list of fines. I know the biggest fine was for PSG, 60 million euros, but only 10 million of it was immediately payable. Um, and the rest was conditional on, on, on future compliance. So it's, it, it, it's effectively a speeding ticket, you know, and I think, I think these, I think these biggest clubs regard it as such. And I think they, you know, I, I think I think they want to stay compliant if they if they can, but I think there's all sorts of pushing pushing of various boundaries going on all over the place, and and 
in some respects that's what clubs do you know in a, in every department of the club they yes. look for yes, edges where they, they can be found yeah. and they've all got very expensive teams of of accountants who are looking at these things and and trying to figure out ways to to give themselves an advantage Liam Toomey from The Athletic with us. Chelsea just spending telephone numbers, transfer deadline day yesterday. Uh, brought in just a, a, an amazing array of players. And, and you know, when you when you read the, you know, the names, you know, this is why I said right at the very start, you're sitting there thinking, heck, this is almost like a second team that they have signed. Uh, how do they squeeze them all in? Or do they not? I mean, does that mean they are going to offload? And what are the, I suppose the, the sub part of that question is, is what does this mean for the rest of their season? Because when you look at those names on a piece of paper, you put them on a, a team sheet and you go, wow, what a great looking side. But can you actually integrate all of that? Do they have time before the end of the season? Well, that's a question for Graham Potter now, isn't it? Um, between now and May. And that that's that's kind of his, his challenge. The problem Chelsea have is that there isn't much left to play for this year. Top four looks a long way off in terms of points, but also in terms of the number of teams that Chelsea would have to jump in order to reach the Champions League qualification places. And in the Champions League itself, I mean, I think you would give Chelsea a very live chance against Borussia Dortmund in the round of 16. Uh, I think Dortmund themselves are not having a brilliant season. Um, and, and then beyond that, of course, it's a cup competition. You can gain momentum and, and unexpected things can happen, but you certainly wouldn't put... Chelsea right now in the inner circle of contenders t- to win the competition they won two years ago so um, it on the surface it, you know just in terms of trophies there isn't a lot left f- to offer Chelsea this season um, but I think Potter will be judged on other things as well by the by the hierarchy which is as you say integrating these players um trying to build a coherent identity on the pitch, which I think four months into his tenure, Potter hasn't hasn't done yet. I think, you know, partly because he he hasn't really been able to do it with all the injuries and, and the lack of um, training time in between matches, particularly leading up to the World Cup. Um, so though, that that's a key priority. And I think, you know, the owners want to see, and the fans as well, who haven't really connected with Potter yet, want to see an improvement in performances and, and, you know, the, the, the hope that they've been given with all this, all, all this uh, spending in the transfer market to be reflected in what they see on the pitch. It's telephone number, you know, and is it is, is, is when I bandy that around, it's only because I remember I'm old enough to remember, mate, the first million pound transfer, Trevor Francis from Birmingham to Nottingham Forest back in 1979. And then when Alan Shearer goes to Newcastle in 95 and 96 for 15 million, that was just staggering. And then, of course, Figo goes for 50 million. You go, for God's sake. And then all of a sudden, Jack Grealish is worth 100 million. What for sitting on the bench and having a floppy haircut? Now we get a guy for 107 million. Where does it stop? And what does 107 million mean to people? Can you even get your head around that amount of money? Yeah, I mean, it's all pretty obscene, isn't it? Um, it's At this stage, it's not really numbers that <laughs> I consciously comprehend on yeah. a day-to-day basis. I think it's more, it, it, they're, they're just abstract figures that reflect football status is the most popular sport in the world and and the money flows from that but it's yeah certainly when you're talking about you know in the uk we've got a cost of living crisis there's energy problem energy problems in europe and um it's economically it's not great in most areas of the world right now and (laughs) you have all this money being thrown around by football clubs chiefly chelsea it's uh it's quite jarring um but i think to a certain extent, football has always operated in its own bubble, and and that and that has just it has has only sort of grown over time, and it and it still feels like it's it's strangely insulated from everything that's going on in in the wider world. One final question: We thank you so much for staying up late for us, mate. Really, really appreciate it. I know you've been so busy over the last twenty four hours too. So taking a call from New Zealand is just awesome of you to do. Back in the old days, I think the players got 5% or something. So when you get sold for $107 million, how much of that does the player actually get? Or do they not even get any of it anymore? I think it's um, I think it varies from, from contract to contract. I don't, I'm not sure it's a standardised thing. 
Um, but players will, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be made whole. Don't worry about that one way or the other. They'll, they'll, they'll be... Sorry, I, was, be I, I wasn't sleeping at night over this. <laughs> they'll be, they'll, you know, they're always signing on bonuses when, when players are signed for new clubs and um, all manner of incentives and image rights agreements and things. So, that, I mean, that's part of the reason why deals of this size take so long to do is that there are the the structures are so complicated you know it, it, in even in terms of chelsea doing this deal they're, they're paying ben, benfica in six installments which is not what benfica wanted <laughs> when 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 these this conversation started um and you know out of that agents get a cut um of course river plate uh enzo fernandez former club in south america getting 25 percent of the fee which i think is quite a nice ripple effect of this transfer um, amazing business for them. Um, so the the money flows everywhere, and the and the the the, the structures of these things have, have become so complex that uh, it, it takes quite a long time, even just to sign the paperwork on deadline day. Which is why I, I I hear you know Chelsea were really rushing towards the end to get this over the line. The old days of the fax machine, hey Liam, it just used to spit out at this time, didn't it? Eh? I mean, there's something quite lovely, glorious, and tactile about that fax spewing out, wasn't it? The, you know, and also the tension it would create as if it actually came through on time and things. Ah, oh, electronics and technology have made it a bit more boring, mate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be fair, faxes were slightly before my time, so <laughs> 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 I'm kind of. Okay, I, I, maybe I'm 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 betraying my age a little bit, but um, yeah, it feels it feels like fax machines persisted in football a lot longer than they did in the in the rest of the world. This is another example of football being kind of a universe to itself.